Romans 15, 13, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. God, thank you that we can come together today to worship you uh, because of that hope, God. Um, I pray that we have done that and that we will continue to do that as we hear the word preached. Um, Father, I pray uh, that your word uh, would penetrate our hearts, God, that we would hear it and that we uh, would decide, God, to, uh, to follow you more and uh, to love you deeper, God. I pray that you would do that work um, through your spirit today. Um, we praise you again just for this time. pray that you would speak through Pastor Jeremy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, church family. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. It's the high priestly prayer. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through about 19 this morning. Uh, really getting through two parts of the high priestly prayer. Jesus praying for himself and Jesus praying for his disciples. Uh, and then next week, um, Elder Justin Smith will be leading you guys on Jesus, Jesus praying for all believers, the third part of the high priestly prayer. Before we get there this morning, I want to remind you last week what uh, the sermon, what we talked about, the truth of the sermon last week. I said this. Followers of Jesus have eternal joy and peace through Christ, and nothing can take this from them. So I said again last week, followers of Jesus have eternal joy and eternal peace through Christ, and nothing or no one can take that joy and peace from them. We found that in John 16, and we'll read to you just a little bit from John 16, verse 22, where God says this, So also you have sorrow now. But I will see you again, your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. That upon seeing Jesus conquer death, hell, and the grave, we as disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, we will no longer be sorrowful. Our sorrow will turn to everlasting joy. Verse 24 says this, Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And we, as followers of Christ, we have this everlasting joy, this joy that is full, that is found in Christ. We also have this peace, we learned in verse 33 of chapter 16. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. But yes, this world will be tough, this world will be hard, we'll face hardships, but through Jesus we have eternal peace, this security, and we have eternal peace joy. And then we find ourselves here in John's gospel chapter 17. But before we get there, there's a few questions that I have for you. And the question is this, what do you find or who do you find satisfaction in? You see, it, it, the, we know the answer to that. It should be Jesus. The answer should be that we find our satisfaction, we find our delight, we find our purpose, we find our meaning, we find our joy in Jesus. That should be the answer. But I want you to do some introspect, right? Like, I really want you to answer that question. Where do you find your joy? Where do you find your satisfaction? Where do you personally find your delight in this world? You see, people search everywhere for it. They search everywhere for some type of joy. They look to get this joy that they long for, for money or status or power, success or popularity or kids or marriage. And they feel like this is what's going to make their life have immense joy, is these things of the world. And if you have went after those, maybe you, like Solomon, say they're all what? Vanity. Vanity of vanity. Like, I have searched the world to find this purpose, to find this joy, to find something that completes me. And everything in this world is vanity and rubbish. Everything in this world is vanity and rubbish. And it doesn't complete me. So I ask again this morning, where are you at in your journey? Seeking for joy. Seeking for meaning. Are you happy? 
You see, so many people think that they're just called to be happy in this world. And as Christians, we should have joy. There should be some happiness in our life, sure. So are you rejoicing? We've already talked about last week the hardships of this world, how hard this world is, how hard this life is. So even in the, the midst of hard times and hardships, do you rejoice? Do you have joy? Are you a little bit happy? Is it seen in your life? I hope so. I hope as followers of Christ that it's seen in your life that you are joyful as the Holy Spirit produces that fruit in your life. But again, there's so many in this life who are searching for satisfaction. They're searching for something to delight in. And I will tell you that his name is Jesus. That his name is Jesus. And here in a moment, we're going to look at his prayer for his disciples. And how he is going to pray for his disciples to have his joy. Jesus is going to pray for his disciples to have Jesus' joy. And that's my prayer for us this morning, that we will have Jesus' joy. Before we get there, let's first take a a deeper look into this high priestly prayer. Okay, because I want to make sure that we understand what's happening here in this, this priestly prayer um, before we dive into the main point of what I'm going to teach from this is about how to delight in God. Well, we first see that this prayer, if you were to study it more deeply, th this prayer um, is really a, a summary of John's gospel. Through this prayer, we're going to see Jesus' obedience to the Father. We're going to see the glory of God through Jesus' death and exaltation. We're going to see the revelation of God in Jesus. We're going to see the choosing of the disciples out of the world. We're going to see the disciples' mission. We're going to see unity in the Father and the Son. And we're going to see believers' final destiny in the presence of the Father and Son. And so all the summary of John's gospel is encompassed here in this prayer, this high priestly prayer. And so I want to read to you just the first 19 verses. So go ahead and look at John 17. We're going to look at verses 1 through 19. Verse 1 says this, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they were kept, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know the truth I came from you, that came, I came from you. And that... And they have believed that you sent me. Verse 9. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one. Even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not only, not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, and they may have, sorry, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. Listen to this. 
but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. For their sake, I have consecrated myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Do you see how beautiful this prayer is? Jesus starts off talking in this, in this posture of reverence. As he looks up, he lifts up his eyes to heaven. He talks about how he delights in the glory of God. He shows his obedience to God and how he fulfills his mission. He shows unity with God as he wants that unity back like they had before the foundation of the world. And then he goes on to pray for his disciples and he prays for their protection and he prays for their knowledge and he prays for their perseverance and he prays for their sanctification. He prays for their mission, right? The mission that God has given them. He says how he guarded them and, and how he doesn't want them to just uh, not be in the world. He wants them to be in the world. He just wants God to protect them from the evil one so they can go out and do the mission of God and grow in sanctification and spread the good news, the mission that he's given them. This beautiful prayer that Jesus is praying for himself and for his disciples. It shows a lot of love. It shows unity. It shows the glory of God. It shows the obedience of the Son. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful prayer. I love the reverence that Jesus is showing the Father. I love how everything is wrapped up in Jesus glorifying the Father and the disciples glorifying God. But that is the main purpose and mission, not only for Jesus, but for the followers of Christ, to glorify the Son and glorify God. The Father. And so we see this prayer. But right in the middle of this prayer, the verse of Scripture that, that I want to cling to this morning and really bring to life this morning is verse 13. And listen to what verse 13 says again. But now I am coming to you that these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus is praying for his disciples to have joy. His joy fulfilled in them. I read, I read th this whole passage to say, yes, this is about reverence. Yes, this is about delighting in the glory of God. Yes, this is about unity. Yes, it's about obedience. It's about sanctification. It's about perseverance. It's about knowledge. It's about their mission. Absolutely. But right here in the middle, Jesus says that he wants the disciples to have his joy. His joy. And just piggybacking off of last week, I just really wanted to flush that out. What is this joy, this, this joy that is Jesus' joy? What is this delight that, that Jesus has that he wants us as followers of Christ to have? You see, if you, if you take a, a, a 10,000 foot view of this, you know that these disciples are about to go through a difficult time. Remember, I talked about it last week. Jesus is about to leave them. They're about to be hated by the world. They're about to face persecution. They're about to to be, go through the hardships of life. And he says, I don't want them not to go through that. I want them to live in the world. I want them to accomplish their mission. I'm not saying to make it easy on them. I'm saying that they have my joy. I'm saying that as they walk through life, that they have Jesus' joy. That's what he's praying for them. A joy that nothing, no circumstance or person can take from them. So what is this joy, this delight, this, this, this satisfaction? How do we receive this type of joy? Because people are searching for it. They're looking for joy. They're trying to find joy. They're attracted to people who are happy and smiling. They are. Joy is contagious, isn't it? It is. Growing up, you'd see people smiling and laughing. It makes you smile. It makes you laugh. 
I was uh, in college at Lenore Ryan, and uh, one of my classes, I had to take a yoga class. Well, my body does not bend like that. And I had to go twice a week for a whole semester. You would have think by the end of it, I could do yoga. Downward dog was about all I got. Um, they, they wanted you to put both of your feet, you know, like, they wanted them to go like this, and both of them to be up there. Never happened, ever. But every time, I would try my best to, to not laugh as I tried to do it, right? And I just, like, I look at my teacher, and I'm like, I can't, I can't do that. But I tried. And I would laugh. And a buddy of mine who's aside, he would laugh, and about 10 minutes in, even the people that can do yoga were laughing, right? Why? It's contagious. Growing up, I remember being around Christians who were always sad. And it wasn't very winsome to me. It wasn't very attractive to me. Because I know that life is hard. I know we deal with a lot of things. But Jesus' joy overpowers that. It overpowers it. Because there's nothing in this world that can take that joy from us. That satisfaction. That eternal life. That redemption that we have. I'm not saying we should walk around with smiles on our face all the time. I'm also... I'm also not saying that we should walk around like we're beaten. We won because Jesus won. We're the victors because Jesus won the victory. This past week, uh, we went on our yearly camping trip with my parents where we all pile into a camper. And it was a lot of joy, right? Back still a little tight from sleeping the way we slept, and it was all great. Um, but on these trips, one of the reasons that I prayed that God would bless me with a big family is because I don't go to the beach to lay at the beach. I don't do that. Like, I'm glad some of you do, and that's wonderful. I would rather probably punch myself in the face um, than just lay out there for hours on the beach. Um, but if you have a lot of kids, they'll play stuff with you. Okay? And so we did. Man, we played... Everything, imagine, that they, I'd say, kids, what do y'all want to do today? I want a body board. Okay. I want to fish. Let's do it. I want to catch crabs in a net. Let's go try. Let's go build sandcastles. You got it. It's going to be a monster. Right? Like, we did. And I asked them, that, that's what we did. But part of that is, uh, at this campground, they have putt-putt. And it's guys against girls. And whoever loses buys ice cream. Now... You may say, wow, you made somebody buy ice cream. It's husband and wife. It came out of the same bank account. <laughs> okay? The kids were getting paid for anyway, so it's all a wash. But either way, losers buy. Okay? And so we get there, and we're playing putt-putt, and it's guys against girls, and the girls go up there, and my wife's like holding a baby, right? And I'm like, oh, advantage us. Not true. First girl up there, hole in one, first hole. It's match play. If you don't know what that means is, best score of the girls, best score of the guy. Single score on that hole, whoever wins, wins a point. Okay, tie, who cares? Okay, so they get up there and, and they make the first one. Micah gets up there, little three-year-old, hits it, banks a few times, goes in. I was like, here we go. Second hole, they make another one. Well, she's laughing. They make six hole-in-ones and 14 holes. They close us out on the 14th hole. I hadn't been beaten like that in a long time. Well, I say all that to say that as they continue to make hole-in-ones, they continue to scream. Woo! And I look around, and my dad, he gets real shy, and he's ashamed to death. Because there's other people around the putting ring. His face is red. He's walked off. <laughs> okay. And I'm looking around, and everybody at the whole place are looking, 
And we don't pay attention, right, because we're so into the game. Everybody's smiling. Everybody's laughing. They're watching us, and they're seeing these kids and girls jump up and down, and boys like... (laughs) And they're smiling. I don't think it's an accident that joy is contagious. That it's something different that this world doesn't always see. I don't think that's an accident. I don't think it's an accident that Jesus is saying he wants his disciples to have his joy. How is it that Jesus can go to the cross and face the torture and do that with a heart that glorifies God? There's something greater involved. And so for us as believers, we should be very winsome in this world. Not with worldly things, but with a joy that can never be taken from us. When we love Jesus and we enjoy Jesus, there's no faking it. There's no faking it. He's everything to us. We glorify Him. We honor Him because we enjoy Him. We treasure Him. He is precious to us. He is of great value to us. I love this. It says, when someone says to a friend, I enjoy being with you, it's a statement expressing both pleasure and value. If a husband gives his wife roses and she asks why, She would not feel honored if he says, what's my duty? But she would feel valued and honored when he says, nothing makes me happier than you. You see, when we treasure God, when we treasure Him, when when He is precious to us, when, when He brings our life value and joy and pleasure, that is when we glorify Him and that is when we show this world something different. So you want to know how to have Jesus' joy, this this joy that is great, this joy that he's praying for for his disciples? Do you want to know how to have that joy in your life? Treasure Jesus. Treasure God. Hold him precious in your sight. See that he is of great value to you. You see, we were created with minds and hearts. And God commands us to know His glory with our minds and to treasure His glory with our hearts. To know His glory and to treasure His glory. And so that's my question for you this morning. Do you know the glory of God? Do you know it? Do you know who He is and what He's done for you? And if you know that, do you treasure it? Do you treasure your redemption? I hope so. There's a lot of people searching. There's a lot of people searching for joy and meaning and purpose, satisfaction. They search a lot of different places. But it's only found in one. And his name's Jesus. Jesus. And so I want to read to you a few things again. Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. You see, the Son wants to glorify the Father. And that's what He does. Since you have given Him authority, verse 2, over the flesh, to give eternal life to whom you have given And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. I glorify you on this earth because I'm obedient to you, because I value you, I treasure you, I hold you precious. Continue on. It says this, verse 6, I have manifest your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. Now that they know everything you have given 
me is from you. Everything that we have that is good is from Him, church. It's from Him. This joy, this good joy that we have is from the Holy Spirit in our life. The sanctification is from the Holy Spirit in our life. This knowledge that we want and have is from the Holy Spirit in our life. This, this perseverance that we have as believers is from the Holy Spirit in our life. Everything that we can produce that's good is from God being in us. Not from ourselves. And I hope you see this. Verse 9, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. They're yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Verse 11, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I am coming to you, Father. Keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. You want this joy? It's through being one with Jesus. Being one with the Father through Jesus. Repenting of your sins. Anchoring yourself to Him. Holding tightly to Him. Having Him in your life. So Jesus is praying for his disciples in verse 6 through 9 that he prays for their knowledge. He prays in verse 10 through 12 for their perseverance. He prays in verses 14 through 17 for their sanctification. He prays in, for, in verse 18, 19 for their mission. And he prays in verse 13 for their joy. That his joy is fulfilled in them. All of these things that Jesus is praying for is from having the Holy Spirit in your life. We as believers who have the Holy Spirit in our life, the Holy Spirit gives us knowledge as He illuminates the Word of God. The Holy Spirit helps us to persevere. The Holy Spirit produces joy in our life. The Holy Spirit produces sanctification so we will grow to be more like God. The Holy Spirit guides us on our mission. He allows us to, to bear fruit and plant seed for the glory of God. And so, you want knowledge in your life, you want joy in your life, you want purpose in your life, you want to grow in sanctification, you want to be on mission for the glory of God. It is through clinging to God, treasuring Him, and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in your life. And that's why as we chase, trace these chapters all the way back, it says that He's going to send the Holy Spirit, which will be to our advantage. And so the application that I have for you this morning is this. You want joy in your life? You want to grow in your knowledge and perseverance and sanctification? Then spend time reading the Word and letting the Holy Spirit apply the Word to your life. Spend time meditating on the Word of God and, and spend time in extended prayer asking the Holy Spirit to guide you and to produce His fruit in your life. You can search this world everywhere you want to go just like Solomon did. You can go and try to enjoy every pleasure thinking they're going to bring your life joy. Or you can trust the Word of God, get on your knees and cling to the Father and allow the Holy Spirit to produce joy and purpose and meaning in your life. This life may be hard for you right now. My challenge for you is to cling to the Word, to cling to God. Joy is unique in its capacity to witness what we treasure. So I say again, what or whom we glorify or honor, that is what we enjoy. John Piper is known for this, this saying, I guess. I mean, it's, it's, he's talking about Christian hedonism. And he says this, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. And so, so many people think that pleasure is anti-God, when in reality, that is not true. Pleasure, in one sense, is a gauge of how much importance we place on something of value. God has designed each of us with an innate desire to pursue happiness. 
The problem is that we seek pleasure. The problem is, the problem is not that we seek pleasure. The problem is that we seek pleasure apart from God. And so let me say that again. Piper said, I think he said it best, in this famous quote of his, that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. When you are satisfied in God, you delight in him, you find your joy in him, you find your happiness in him, you find your pleasure in him. And again, pleasure is not anti-God. Pleasure is not something we shouldn't seek. We, should not, we just shouldn't seek it outside of God. The pleasure, true pleasure, true joy, true happiness, true purpose comes only from God and is found in God. So the problem is not that we seek pleasure. The problem is that we seek pleasure apart from God. There is no true lasting joy that is greater than valleys of life outside of delighting in the Lord. There's nothing greater. Jesus' joy trumps over the valleys of life. So treasuring God was the prayer of Jesus for his disciples, and it's his prayer for us. I love what Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 says. Listen to what the Word of God says. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Let me read that for you again, Philippians 3, 8. Listen to what the Word of God says. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, worthless, in order that I may gain Christ. Gaining Christ is what we should commit our life to. Treasuring him, clinging to him, holding to him in his word, in his knowledge, in his truth. He should be precious to us. He should be everything to us. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. And that is true. So I hope that you are satisfied in Him. You want the joy, Jesus' joy? It comes from finding satisfaction in the Lord. Clinging to the Lord. Clinging to Him when times are good, when valleys are hard. You cling to Him. You love him. You hold fast to him. So I'm going to read to you John or Romans 15, 13. Justin read it for us at the beginning. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. In believing. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Now, all that that I preached is is said right there in one verse, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, in holding, in treasuring Jesus, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So I hope that you believe, and I hope that you abound, and I hope that you have a joy that can never be taken from you in Christ Jesus. So I ask again in conclusion, where do you find satisfaction? For who are you delighting in? Where does your happiness, your pleasure, and your joy come from? If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm struggling. That's hard. I know. We face a lot of hardships, a lot of hard times. I know. Let me remind you, in those hardships, in those hard times, there's nothing in this world that can create joy in your life apart from Christ. Nothing or no one. Life is hard, but God is good and he is faithful. Let's pray.
God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the joy that you give us through the Holy Spirit in our life. I pray uh, that whatever is going on in the life of my people, people you have given me to love and to shepherd, and I pray that they leave today clinging tightly to you, casting all of their cares and all their burdens, all their hardships at your feet, and resting in your joy, resting in your loving and secure arms, experiencing the peace that only comes from God. And so, Father, I pray that you will help them this morning. I don't want life to be hard for them, but I know so often that it is. I know that one day we'll be in a better place, but while we're here on this earth, I pray that we remember that everything in this life that is good comes from you. And I pray that we will cling to you and not the things of this world. It's in Jesus.